Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Build an AR Robot Assistant in Unity workshop. Um, if you could just confirm for me, I want to make sure that everyone's able to hear me okay and, uh, and my video is coming through properly. Perfect. Thank you very much, guys. I know we have a lot of people joining us today, so I'm just going to wait a few minutes to let everyone join in. Uh, while we do that, I want to do a few housekeeping items. Um, as you probably have already figured out, we do have a chat option. So throughout the session, please, if there's any comments, any questions or anything like that, please feel free to throw that in the chat section for us. And uh, we also do have a questions tab as well. At the end of this uh, workshop, we are going to do a Q&A with Nikisa. So if you have any questions that you would like her to answer live, please pop them in the questions section and we'll get those answered for you guys. And lastly, um, there is a polls tab as well. I will be posting a couple of polls in there throughout the workshop. So if you could uh, take part in those, that would help us greatly. And uh, just a reminder for everyone that this session is recorded and everyone who registered uh, for today's workshop will receive the recording and as well as any of the resources that we share as well. Um, while we wait, I always do this and I it's kind of a fun thing for myself. I always keep a note and a list of all the different locations that people attend these workshops from. So if everyone could just post in the chat, uh, where is everyone from? Vancouver, Montreal. I'm actually headed to Montreal next weekend. California, nice. New York City. Netherlands and Sweden, nice. Global audience today. Mexico, awesome. Norway, nice. I have to say, this is one of the more global workshops that we've had uh, in, in at least the last couple that I hosted. Nice. Perfect. So um, I'm just going to get started here right away. So just a little bit about myself. My name is Roham or Ro. It's easier for everyone to remember. I'm an enrollment advisor here at Circuit Stream with uh, seven plus years of uh, working experience in business development and customer service. I used to also be a semi-pro soccer player, but or for football player for those of us not in North America. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, the pandemic uh, and uh, old age put a stop to that. Um, and for today's workshop, we actually brought out one of our uh, rock stars for you guys. Nakisa's background in engineering and arts combined for a very unique approach to XR development. Um, you know, she has designed and developed projects for the HoloLens, Magic Leap, Oculus Quest, uh, and Valve Index. And on her off time, she's either searching for new jokes or taking part in a circus. Um, so. I'm very excited to have her on board with us today. And uh, just a little bit about our company here. Uh, we're an education company founded back in 2015. And our founders back in 2015 noticed a gap in personalized training and education uh, space in the immersive technology. And to date, we've supported over 40,000 individual learners in XR and in Unity. And uh, you know these learners have taken part in our various workshops like the one we're hosting today, as well as our courses over the years. And this is one of the milestones that we're incredibly proud to have reached. And, you know, we're always looking to improve that number and, uh, you know, take on more students and put more people into the XR industry and introduce people to this amazing technology. Uh, what we have here at CircuitStream is a global team of industry experts who are passionate about accelerating the AR and VR industry through education. You know, we have team members and instructors all over the world, which also helps us accommodate students in multiple time zones and regions around the world. Uh, we are also a Unity training and channel partner. And for those of you who don't know, partners of Unity are approved based on their expertise, focus on quality, 
education as well as uh, the demonstrated success of their students and uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with unity they have cre they've created one of the uh, most extensive and robust development engines on the market which will shed a little bit uh, more light on very shortly and uh, it's worth to mention that uh, our instructors actually maintain the highest level of certification offered by unity in terms of our academic portfolio uh, we have an academic portfolio of free online workshops and webinars like today's session and also a variety of courses that we offer which are all designed to help students learn how to build VR and AR content in Unity. Um, I mean, these courses are mainly for beginners, but we also help more intermediate and advanced students uh, through our one-on-one -on -one sessions or our team uh, training offerings as well. Uh, if you're looking for XR-specific training, we have our XR Developments with Unity course for developers, as well as our Interaction Design and Prototyping for XR uh, course for those of you who are more design-oriented uh, and would like to pursue the more design aspect of the XR world. Uh, we also recently launched our Unity Developer Bootcamp and this is an immersive 24 week live online bootcamp to prepare you for a successful career in 3D development. And I have to say, this is by far the most extensive program we have ever offered here at CircuitStream. So, one of the questions that we always get asked is who have we actually worked with? Well, we've trained. Uh, teams and professionals and individuals uh, for some of the largest organizations in the world. I mean, just to name a few, Apple, Meta, Hershey's, and, and even the US Navy. Uh, we work with organizations large and small, you know, right down to the individual learners. So, uh, you know, that's one of the one of the things that makes us uh, work with these organizations. We, we, we do again right down to the individual learner which is awesome and i'm also proud to announce that as of uh, this year circuit stream has been partnering with some of the world's most prestigious universities to uh, offer our educational programs for example our xr development with unity program as well as our xr design program is now offered by uh or offered to continuing education departments by all of the institutions that you see on screen here right now and we're also launching Launching a new partnership or new partnerships, I should say, with more schools throughout North America uh, in the coming year. So please stay tuned for that. Now, getting a little bit more specific, what exactly is Unity? If you've seen this interface uh, before, then you've most likely already are familiar with Unity. And if you've seen this muffin clicker game on screen, then you've probably been through our C Sharp scripting fundamentals course. But for those of you who aren't familiar, Unity is a free uh, development engine. It's a program that can be used to create both 2D and real-time 3D content, which would include augmented reality as well as virtual reality. And in our opinion, Unity is definitely the program most beginner-friendly or the engine most beginner-friendly if, uh, if you're looking to begin making your own XR applications. Uh, we know that uh, Unity is used to create over 60% of the world's AR and VR content and is also responsible for an enormous share of the broader content and application uh, markets. And like anything, you know, these applications all start with an idea. From there, uh, you need to build your assets and, uh, and bring them into the Unity engine and create an immersive interaction using scripts in the c -sharp programming language. Then once you're happy with your build, you need to leverage an SDK or a software, the software development kit to ensure that your target device is compatible with your build. And once you've done that, you can go ahead and render and publish your application and Boom. I mean, it's a little bit easier said than done, but, you know, uh, that's kind of the brief uh, process. Now, enough about all of those learning opportunities. Let's talk about what you guys are going to be learning in this amazing workshop. Uh, in today's workshop, you're going to be learning the fundamentals of AR development using Unity. You're going to learn how to set up boundaries for your AR objects using plane detection, how to enable and implement mobile joystick controls, as well as how to build and utilize simple AR animations in Unity and how to control your robot using your smartphone. 
that will conclude my portion of the presentation. I'd like to remind everyone that uh, this session is being recorded and that everyone who signed up uh, to join us today will receive both the recording and the project assets after the fact. And without further ado, I'd like to take this time to invite Nikisa back or Nakisa on the stage, I should say. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to have Nakisa join us today. And uh, Nakisa, take it away, please. Hello, hello. Yeah, let's just do a sound check. Can everyone see and hear me? Yes, all good. Oh, good. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. Well, hi. Hello. I'm Nikisa. I will be your instructor for today, and we will be building an AR robot. AR robot. So let's get started here. I'm going to share my screen. And let's see. Can everyone see my screen here? Yes. We have a lot of yeses. See, we. Nice. Okay. So before we get started, we need a couple of assets from the asset store. One will be the actual robot that we'll be using, and the other will be a joystick. So let's head on over to the Unity asset store in your web browser. Let's just go to Unity uh, asset store. So the Unity Asset Store is a place where you can purchase um, and a wide range of things ranging from like 3D models to actual code packages to whatever it is that you want to create. Now, in order for you to purchase anything, even if they're free, you do need to log in using your Unity account, using your Unity ID and all of that stuff. As you can see right in this top corner here, I am logged in as Nikisa underscore D. <laughs> and you can, you can also make your custom sounds using any sort of recording software. My preference is Audacity or Audacity. The A. Audacity. Anyways, um, so we are going to be using one, a robot. So let's type in robot and hit enter and search. And when we are searching, uh, searching things here, we have a list of robots and there's a sale. Oh, robots ultimate pack. Oh, they're so cute. Focus, focus. Okay. Um, we are looking for free assets. So check free and this is the robot sphere that we will be using today. So we need to add this asset to our account. So let's click on that. And you can add this. If you don't have it already, I already do. Uh, you can click on Open in Unity or Add to My Assets. Um, those things. So I already have it added to my account. So let's go over the second asset that we will be using. This is the robot sphere. And next we are looking for a joystick and hit enter. So we are also looking at free assets. So let's check that because I am a, I'm a little bit of a troopscape. But anyways, this is the joystick pack that we will be using today. So add it to your assets, add it to your account, and do all of those fangs all of them fangs <laughs> hello is this the joystick is this it uh yes so this is the joystick that we will be using so i already have this added to my account so i'm just going to dive right into the unity hub which we saw previously so what i've done is i've just opened up unity hub and clicked on a new, and this will be, we'll be using version 2020.3.26. 2023.26. Now it's okay if you don't have the right version um, or the version that I'm using, you can still use whichever version you're using. So projects, and then this will come up and we have a location which will be in the GitHub repository that's supplied to you. Um, 
And then you want to name your project. Name your project. So the other thing that we're going to be using is just a regular 3D template. We're not going to be using the high definition render pipeline or the universal render pipeline or anything special like that. We're just going to use the 3D pipeline right here. So check 3D. And we want the AR robot assistant. So now that we have all of these things specified, let's create a Unity project. Let's hit that lovely create button right there. Clicking on create. And then this will open up on the other side. On the other side. And then we we'll just sit back and relax a little bit as it opens. Let me drink some coffee. You know what I was reading? I was reading that there was a ketchup factory that closed in Canada and now it reopened in Ontario. I mean, like, it's probably a bad idea to close it in the first place. And that's just recognized in Heinz's site. Uh, anyways, so hi, hello, welcome to the Unity Editor, our best friend here. So who is, so the assets that you're downloading are in the Unity Asset Store. So there's this joystick pack, and then there was, let's go back, back, Robot Sphere, the Robot Sphere that we'll be using. And this is all in the Unity Asset Store. So now that we have that added to the Unity Asset Store, there are some things, some things that we need to go over. So this will be mobile AR. So I'm going to be using an Android device right here. Um, and if you are using an Android device, you can either use a Mac or a PC, as long as you have those um, modules installed. So on the modules, you can go to installs and you can see here for my version of Unity, I have Android build support right there. So I have Android build support. I don't have iOS because I am not on a Mac, although there are some ways that you can get around it and I have and they're slightly illegal, but we don't mention that. Anyways. <laughs> so now what we can do is we need to import the packages and things that we will be using. So we're gonna be using something called AR Foundation. Now, AR Foundation is um, the AR packages that is uh, cross-platform, so it's platform agnostic. You can use it for iOS, you can use it for Android, all those things. All of those. Thanks. So I will be using an Android phone to build on. That is my preference. Now, before we even get to building on this phone, your phone must be in developer mode. So on your Samsung or your whatever Android phone you're on, go into your settings, enable developer mode. Now, I won't go over that. Um, you, can, you can look up guides online. That's okay. Uh, your iPhone, if you're using an iPhone, it also needs to be in developer mode, which you do through Xcode. So yes, Sebastian, um, the iPhone does also need to be in developer mode in order for us to build anything on it. So making sense, making sense so far. Yep. Yep, yep. Nice. See. See. Uh, yes, this build um, will be on an Android build. So let's do all the packages, all of the packages that we need to install first and foremost. So where we install these packages are up at the top. We have the window and then we have package manager. So again, that's window and package manager. 
the package manager is where we'll be downloading our assets and AR foundation that we'll be using. So in the package manager, right now we are looking at packages in the project right up there. Can everyone see that? It's, it's pretty small, but can everyone see that? Packages in project. Right there, a little drop down menu. So we're gonna switch these packages in project. We're gonna switch this, clicking on that little drop down menu, clicking on that. And we're gonna go to first, my assets. So this is where we'll be downloading the a uh, sphere robot and the joystick pack. So let's go to my assets. And we can see that I have, I have a lot of assets. <laughs> I have too many assets. It's addicting. Don't get sucked in. It's kind of like that, that steam summer sale, you know, for gamers out there. <laughs> just blow all, just take all my money. Take it. <laughs> so because I have so many assets here, uh, right in the search bar, I can search for anything that I want to work on. So let's search for the robot sphere. And there it is. So <laughs> there's also banana man, but let's not use that. Um, let's click on the robot sphere. And this is the asset that I showed earlier that we're going to be using. So clicking on that robot sphere, we are either going to download and import, but since I have already have mine downloaded, I'm going to just import it into my project. So click on import. And this is a list of all the things that will be imported, the list of all the things that are in the package. You want to make sure everything is checked because we want everything. And then we click on import. import that thing. All right, cool. So we see down in the project tab, right down at the bottom left, this project tab, whoops, this project tab is basically the file directory of your project. So you can find this in a your file directory by clicking on right click assets, and show in Explorer, and this will show you the file directory of your project. Or you can do show in Finder, which is your Mac equivalent. But this is a file uh, of where all of our all of our stuff will be. So we have the uh, robot sphere in the project. Let's get that joystick inside the project too. Let's go to search for joystick. And joystick pack, there it is. Joystick pack, you can download and import. So let's click on import. And there it is, let's do import. Okay, so now that we see we have the joystick pack here, we have the robot sphere, those are the two assets that we'll be using. So we can close the, well, actually we don't need to close the package manager yet because there is one more thing that we need to import, and that is AR Foundation itself. So AR Foundation is part of the Unity registry. So since we're looking in my assets, let's click on this and go to Unity registry. Unity registry. And then we can search for AR Foundation. It's in alphabetical order. So there it is, AR Foundation. Let's click on that and install. So AR Foundation speaks to both iOS and Android. It is bilingual in that manner. But since I will be on an Android phone, the uh, SDK that I need to import, the software development kit that I need to import in order to launch on this thing is actually AR Core. So we have AR Foundation, I don't know if you can read that, but you know, so in AR Foundation, it has iOS and an 
Android. In order to speak to iOS, we need something called AR Kit. And in Android, we need AR Core. So AR Kit is the AR um, package that we want in order to use any sort of AR function, augmented reality function on an iOS. AR Core is the same thing except for Android. Making sense? So we have, <laughs> yes, yes, aye, aye, Captain. So we have AR Foundation in, already installed in our project. The next thing that we need to do, because I will be using an Android, I need to download AR Core. If you use an iOS, you're going to download AR Kit. And you can include both in the same project. So let's go back to Unity. And we see we have AR Core and AR Kit XR plugin. We're going to use AR Core for Android. AR kit for iOS. So let's click on AR core and click on install. Clicking on install. There will be two scripts that we will be creating. Don't worry, it's going to be super simple. One script will be for controlling the robot and the other script will be for getting the robot in the scene in the first place. So creating the robot, moving it around, all that stuff. All right, so let, who's, who's seen the Unity Editor before? Let's throw up some hands. Who has seen the Unity Editor? Who has a little bit of experience with the Unity? Jonathan, you do. Ricardo, Pedro, Kristen, Sanji. Okay, cool. Who is a complete, ah, David, yes. Who is a complete beginner, has never seen this ever before? Adam, complete noob. Mike, okay. Okay, cool, okay. So let's just go over the, the Unity editor itself. So over to the left-hand side, we have something called the hierarchy. Now the hierarchy, as opposed to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it is the hierarchy of game objects. Now each thing in the scene that we create is called a game object. Game object is just overarching term for any, any of these things in the hierarchy. So this main camera that I've selected is a game object, this directional light, is a game object, all of these things. So the hierarchy basically shows which game objects are in your scene. Now, how do we know what's in our scene? And what is the scene exactly? Well, if we look at the scene tab right here, the scene tab is where we do our world building. If we're creating, and I'll just, and all these tabs, all, all of these things are completely customizable. So you can move this, you can move this, you can move this, you can move this. All of it is completely customizable. So to make this a little bit more clear, I'm going to drag this game tab and drop it over here. Game. So the game, the game tab is what your player, what your user will be seeing. It's basically uh, doing the rendering to your screen. And this is where this is where we see it. So the scene view right here, if I click on this tab, is where we do our world building and all that stuff. Um, and the game tab is when we see the creation that we've made. So if I hit play, it'll show my game. And it'll run whatever it is that I've created. So does that make sense? Adam, yes. Yes, it makes sense. Diana, nice. Jonathan, nice, nice. We. <laughs> so we need to do our AR 
world building because we are going to be using our phones and the cameras on the phone to get the uh, little robot into our world that we perceive through the phone. So since we have AR Foundation already installed, we need to get the hierarchy all up and ready for an AR session, it's called. So let's right click in the empty space here, right clicking. And since I have AR Foundation installed, I have this lovely XR section right there down at the bottom. Now, if I hover over XR, I'm going to create two game objects. And these are very important game objects for all AR Foundation scenes, all AR Foundation worlds. The first thing I'm going to do is create an AR session origin. So I'm going to click on that and create an AR session origin game object. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to right click in the hierarchy and go to XR. And this will be the second game object we create. And this will be called an AR session. So clicking on the AR session and we've created two game objects here. We have the AR session origin and the AR session. And um, Jonathan, if you install Apple uh, AR Kit, it's not going to change any of the way that we're going to do things. We are going to be creating things so that they'll work on the iOS and the Android phone. So what are these game objects? The AR session, if I click on that, you'll see it populates all the way over to the right hand side in the inspector. The inspector tab is basically what Huh. inspects your game object. What is making this game object? What comprises of it? What components are on it? You know, kind of like saying that um, glasses are made out of metal material, glasses, and glass, or plastic, whichever. Um, so this inspector is showing us what this game object, this AR session origin is made of. And there are three components. There is a transform, there's an AR session, and an AR input manager. These are the three components that make up this game object. Every game object will have a transform. Every game object will have a transform. The AR session, however, is something special. The AR session game object and the purpose of the AR session is basically just to start your um, APIs, your SDKs, start start kind of like uh, kind of like warming up the engine of a car. It's setting all of your AR uh, foundation sessions up to enable AR capabilities on your phone. Now, does that make sense? Yes, makes sense, making sense. Okay, cool. So let's, yes, yes, Adam, nothing will work without an AR session. Exactly. You need an AR session for AR Foundation to start anything. So what is the AR session origin? Now, this is a really interesting question because when you're building a virtual world or a regular 3D world in your scene view, you, it's it's measured in distances and uh, coordinates, and you have an X and you have a Y and a Z, and these these three key pieces of information describe the position of where something is in relation to an origin, what we know to be zero and zero and zero, right at that one point, the origin of your three D world. So what is the origin when it comes to an AR world? Because in AR, we are in our home environment. We are out in the world walking about. So what is the origin? Is the origin the center of your room? But if it is the center of your room, how do we calculate that? Or is the origin the center of the city? But if it's the center of the city, then how do we measure that? 
is the origin the center of Earth? Is it the center of the solar system? Is it the center of the universe? <gasps> what is the origin? So, existential crisis. <laughs> So what the AR recession origin does, because there is only one measurable thing that we can actually rely on, is it does a whole bunch of matrix calculations and all of that lovely math to make sure that the session or the origin of this world is at your camera or, in other words, your phone. Your phone is always going to be at zero, zero, zero. Always. And that is how we take the origin of this world. And that is what the AR session origin is doing. So since we have an AR camera here and it has a camera component, we don't need two cameras. So clicking on that main camera, let's delete that and delete. And now, our hierarchy is all set up and ready to go for AR foundation. Now, let's describe the two processes that are necessary for us to create an AR assistant. We need to detect a surface or a plane that um, our phone is going to recognize for as you know a plane, as a, an object. Um, so on the AR session origin, over in the inspector on the right hand side, we're going to add a component and add an AR plane manager right there. Hit enter. So again, that was adding component, searching for AR plane looking for the AR plane manager, highlighting that and clicking that. So the AR plane manager manages and is tasked with managing, um, recognizing any surface that you want to detect. Now, right now it's detection mode is everything. So that means it will detect vertical and horizontal planes. So since it doesn't make sense for us to have a, a sphere that's crawling up walls or something creepy like that. Let's switch it from everything to be nothing first. It's going to be nothing. And then clicking on that and then going to horizontal. So it will only detect horizontal planes. Only. Only detect. Making sense so far? So now we have plane recognition. But hold on, hold up, hold up. We have a plain prefab, non-game objects. Well, what does this mean? So this plain prefab, what happens is that the airplane manager will detect a plane and it will instantiate a game object that conforms to the surface of the plane in order for us to detect collisions or anything, anything like that because we need to detect collisions if we are to get the robot in the scene, in the scene, and it can walk around on a surface that we detect. So we need to create an AR plane manager. I believe we can right click in the hierarchy and go to XR, and let's create an AR default plane. Clicking on the AR default plane and this AR default plane, if we click on that, over in the inspector has an AR plane, AR plane mesh visualizer, a mesh collider, filter, renderer, line renderer, all that stuff. So what are these things? What do these things do? The AR plane will be an object that conforms to the size of the plane that the AR plane manager detects. So it'll just, <laughs> it'll just <laughs> conform to the size of your plane that you have created. <laughs> and that's what this does. So we have a mesh collider 
which will be the component in or uh, that detects any sort of collision, any digital collision that happens on this. And then we have a mesh filter, which contains the vertices, the edges, the triangles, um, the shape, basically the shape of an object. And they have a mesh renderer, which contains how that object is going to look. So it'll contain color, it'll contain reflectivity, that sort of thing. And does that make sense so far? Yes. Nice. 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 10 to 4. I don't know what that means, but I'm going to take it to mean a good thing. <laughs> so let's click on the AR session origin. Now you'll notice that this is a plane prefab. We need to make this default plane into a something called a prefab. So a prefab is a um, prefabricated game object that we'll be able to use over and over and over again. Is altering the size of the plane how you control the size of the object? Ah, good question. Um, altering the size of this game object, because right now it's a scale of zero or one, one, and one. The size of this, the size of this plane is actually dictated by the AR plane manager. It measures the size of the plane that it's detected and uses that size to modify the size of this prefab that we'll be instantiating. Now, does that make sense? Yes, nice. So let's make a prefab out of this AR default plane. Kind of like how in the train montage of Mulan, Disney's Mulan, there was, we'll make a man out of you. We'll make a prefab out of you. <laughs> so in order for us to make a prefab out of this game object, we're just going to drag it and drop it into our assets and dragging, dropping it, boom. And there we go. So we see that immediately it has changed to a blue color to indicate that it is now a prefab. And we can see that it persists in our project right there. <laughs> From prefab, I'm just going to do what I need to do to become an auto fab. <laughs> you just have to be fabulous. <laughs> So now that we have created this prefab and it persists throughout these things, we can click on this game object and we can delete it from the hierarchy without actually deleting it from our project entirely. So we can reuse this prefab over and over and over and over and over again, which is what we want, which is the behavior that we want to see. So let's click on the AR session origin. And now we have to connect this prefab to the prefab space right there. So we're just going to drag the AR default plane prefab in our assets folder, that prefab we just created. We're going to drag this and drop it into where that none game object is. So I'm going to click and drag it here. So you see that none game object is highlighted blue, right? Highlighted blue, we're dropping it there. And there we go. So now we have a plane that will be instantiated for each plane that we detect. And this is what we want. So now that we are detecting these planes, we have two things to do. We need a method or some way to control how we're going to be uh, controlling the robot. And then we also need to control how we're getting the robot in there in the first place. So let's handle the first thing. Let's handle how we're going to control the robot once we get it into the scene. And this is where the joystick comes in. 
Now the joystick is a two-dimensional object. It's part of the UI system of Unity. <laughs> thinking about becoming a fab. <laughs> I'm one step ahead of me by being a prefab. <laughs> nice. So let's get introduced to the UI system of Unity. I'm going to right click in here in the hierarchy and go to UI and I'm going to create a canvas. Now the canvas is the game object that organizes all of our 2D aspects. So that'll be our uh, joystick, buttons, text, all those things. So let's double click on the canvas. And there it is. And double clicking just focuses on the game object. And we're just going to navigate around here. So I'm going to hold Alt and left key or left mouse key to move around. Like so. So this is the canvas that we'll be working with. Um, now we need to get the joystick into our scene. So let's go to the joystick pack and let's go into prefabs. <laughs> and we want a fixed joystick. So this prefab to just get it into the scene, since it's already made for us, it's super easy. We're going to click on the fixed joystick and drag it over on top of the canvas. So you see how it's highlighted light grayish, light grayish there? This means that my fixed joystick, once I drop it here, will be a child of the canvas. Boom. So now we have a joystick in the scene and we can control the robot and move it around. So your fixed joystick is a child, what's called a child of this canvas. Making sense? Yes, this is recorded and will absolutely be posted later on. You'll get the entire project in a GitHub repo in an email sent to you after. So we have the fixed joystick that we will be using. Um, now, if I hit play, to see what my changes done are done, um, or hit play to experience what I've already built. Let's hit play right here. And there it is. So this is what my camera will be seeing. So I can click on this joystick and move it around, let go and boop, 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 boop. So we'll be using this with our thumbs to move the robot around. And there we go. So we have a way to control the robot. Now we have to look at getting the robot in there, in the scene, in the first place. So let's go into assets and we'll be creating two scripts. One will be to tap on the screen and get the thing in there. And the other will be to control the robot. So I'm gonna right click in here and go to create a script and since this we want to name this really simple really descriptive and let's just call this tap to place capital t for tap capital t for two and capital p for place now when you're naming your scripts no spaces no space for you no spaces and then you hit enter so that's one script that we'll be creating let's do the other script that we'll be using let's right click and go to create and let's create a c sharp script and this will be the robot let's call it a touch controller so these scripts need to be on a living game object a game object that is enabled and alive in the hierarchy what i mean by that is on this, oh, this game object, AR session origin is way over to the right hand side. This inspector, it's, do you see that little check mark? And then check. And it's disabled. Now it's enabled. Disabled, enabled. We want these script, scripts to be on an enabled 
game object. So on the AR session origin, we're going to attach the tap to script or tap to place script. So I'm going to click and drag it right there. So you see that blue, blue bar right in the inspector and then drop it there. And there we go. So now we have a tap to place script to do the thing. Next is we will double tap to open, <laughs> double tap, double click to open that up in our preferred um, scripting editor. So who has seen a script before? Who's seen these things? Who's seen it? Who done it? Nyla, Pedro, nice. It prompts can't add script. Hmm. Nice. All right. So everyone has seen, well, mostly, mostly everyone has seen these things. So let's just go over some of the basics of um, what this is going to be doing. So let's do... Let's do a, um, I'm using Visual Studio. Um, Visual Studio, you can download it with your, with your Unity editor. Um, you can use any other IDE. Um, sometimes people use something called Rider. Sometimes people use, uh, on Macs, it's Visual Studio for Mac. Um, so the first thing that we want to make sure is that the name of this script matches the public class, this public class. So tap to place is the same as tap to place right up there. Rule numero uno. And there we go. So what is a public class? Uh, I'll just go over this real quickly. A public class is basically a container uh, for the blueprints of what your code is going to be doing, of what it is that we're going to be doing. You can think of it like um, like a strand of DNA. Um, your DNA contains the blueprints of how an organism is to be constructed, what everything does, all that stuff, its behavior, all that stuff. So you can think of a public class kind of like the DNA of your behavior. So we want everything we do to be inside of these curly brackets, these curly boys right there, like a little babushka doll. And let's hit enter right here and right between this curly bracket and right here, this is where we will be declaring any variables that we'll be using. So let's go over some of the variables that we will be using. The first variable, uh, variables like a container of information that we want to use over and over and over again, like a prefab. And so we can have a public, private, something like that. So this is called an access modifier. And we want a public. Now we have to describe the data type of the variable. And the type of this variable will be a type of game object. So remember what a game object is. It's any sort of game object that you create in the hierarchy or in your assets, that sort of thing. Now we've created this little container. We need to give this container a name so we can call it uh, whenever we want. And let's call this the robot prefab. And a semicolon. We end our sentences with a semicolon there. Public game object prefab, robot prefab. Making sense? We're going to go over this a little quickly, um, but don't worry, it will all be worked out. If this isn't making sense um, and you want to like a little bit more information, uh, you can inquire about the intro to C Sharp that we offer. Uh, to get you more prepared for the XR Dev course. It's super good. I teach it. 
and Dustin teaches it, and a bunch of other people teach it. We're all pretty good. Um, so now what we need to do is we need some AR foundation things. In order for us to use AR foundation, though, we have to add that library to our vocabulary. So right up here in these namespaces, we're going to add using unityengine.xr.ar foundation right there. And now we'll have access to things like an AR Raycast manager or stuff like that. And so let's get started with the AR Foundation stuff. So this doesn't need to be exposed. It can just be private and uh, specific to this script. So let's do a private static list. And so a list is just, you know, a little list of things like your grocery list. It has one element and another element and another element and another. So we're going to do a list. And in angle brackets, we have to describe what type of things um, these will be. So it's a little bit more detailed in your grocery list, like you have a list of type of fruit. So this list will be like apples, oranges, pineapples, but that's specifically fruit. So we have to describe what type that we're doing here. Instead of fruit, we'll do A, R, Raycast, Hit. And we're going to call this list hits. And this will equal, we're initializing the list. So new list of AR Raycast hits. And we open closing parentheses and a semicolon. And then hit enter. So does this make sense? This makes sense. So let's describe how we're going to do this Raycast or, or how we're going to get the little robot into our scene. So we have you and this is you and this is your phone. Boop. And then we have, you know, the ground in front of us. So what we're going to do is we are going to use something called a Raycast, which is shooting an invisible ray from some point and ends up somewhere here. Oops. Right there. So a ray cast is just a invisible ray that starts here, goes in a direction, and saves all the information that we have here, right at this point, this hit point. So we're going to start at a position. We're going to start at the phone or where we tapped on the phone. And then we're going to go in a direction. We're going to save all of the information right at this point in a hit, the list of hits. And this is a raycast. How does that make sense? We are going to hit the ground, the plane that we've detected. So this, this point right here will be a point on that AR plane, will be a point on a plane that the phone has detected because on this plane, we have something called a mesh collider. Remember, this collider is the thing that detects collisions, detects collisions. So this is where we will be doing that stuff. Yes, the list is a list of multiple hits that we've done. Um, because AR Foundation organizes AR Raycast hits in a list, and it's organized by distance. So the first hit will be the hit closest to you. And that is a Raycast. So this here, we're going to save the Raycast hits, but we also need access to the thing that's going to be doing the AR 
raycasting in the first place. And this is called a private AR raycast manager right there. And enter there. And now we need to give this variable a name. Let's just call this the raycast manager. Manager right there. And a semicolon. So since we only want one of these robots in the scene at a time, we need to save a reference to the spawned prefab that we've created in the scene. Let's do a private game object, and this will be the spawned prefab. The spawned prefab. So we need that AR Raycast manager, which means on the AR session origin, in order to do the ray casting, we need to add another component. We need to add component and add an AR Raycast Manager. There it is, boom. And there we go. So let's continue with the script. Now, this script, this tap to place right here, needs to know about this AR Raycast Manager because we have a variable here. We have a little bucket that needs to be filled with information. So we're gonna use our very good friend called get component. Yes, the hits need to be static. The hits need to be static. This list needs to be static. So in the start method, we are going to get this AR Raycast Manager, so this tap to place can start talking to this component. So in the start, we're going to say Raycast Manager equals get component, and in angle brackets, what type of component are we getting? We are getting a type of AR Raycast Manager, open and closing parentheses, and a semicolon. And now we have our AR Raycast Manager. So this will be in the start method. The start method is called uh, before the first frame update. And this is called automatically. We don't have to do anything right there. It will just be called automatically and we don't have to worry about it. Next is we're gonna use the update, which is called once per frame. So every frame, your update is being called. So if you have a frame rate of like 60 frames per second, that means your update is going to be called 60 times a second. So we can use the update to detect any differences in information per frame. And we're going to use the update to detect first a touch on the screen. If we have a touch on the screen, we are going to create the robot where the Raycast hit. We're going to create it right there, right on this plane. So we're gonna tap on the screen, shoot a ray, create it there. Making sense so far? Nice. Why would the second part of the line we're in game object or Raycast manager not in blue? So, that's a good question. Um, the blue represents um, hmm, the blue represents general uh, commands and functions, um, access modifiers, things that are that are very general. So the reason why this AR Raycast Manager isn't blue is because we are calling the variable. We're calling this variable AR Raycast Manager because this variable needs to know this. It needs to know this AR Raycast Manager on this game object. So here we're just calling it by name and using get component AR Raycast Manager. So now we have to first detect a touch on a screen. Um, so the a general convention of an if statement is, let's say we have if in condition here, if hungry, 
And then we have the curly fries, the curly brackets. We will eat. So if condition, do the thing. If hungry, eat. So say if touch screen, then we will eat. Make sense? Um, if your game object is in black, you might not have your, your IDE, your Visual Studio might not actually be talking to Unity itself. And that's a problem that I won't be going over in this workshop. Um, but that is something that we go over in the XR Dev class and in the uh, C Sharp class and all that stuff. So in the update, we have to detect a touch. And then once we have, we'll create the thing. So we'll say if in parentheses, the condition and the condition is if input dot touch count, touch count right there is greater than zero. So input dot touch count is like every time we touch on the screen, right? Every time we touch on the screen, it's a touch one, touch two, touch three, four, and so on and so forth. So as long as this touch count is above zero, that means we've touched the screen. So let's do the curly bracket. So let's do the, the um, ray casting. So here we are detecting the touch on the screen. Now what we have to do is we have to do the recasting. So this is also going to be in an if statement because yo dog, I heard you like if. So we put an if within an if. So let's do if parentheses here, and we're gonna use that raycast manager to do the raycasting. So we'll do raycast manager dot raycast. And where are we? Raycasting, well, we are raycasting from the touch position of our fingers. So this will be input dot get touch. And which touch are we getting? We are getting zero and then add a dot position. Input dot position. And so we are touching the screen. And it's starting here, but remember, we need a direction. We need the direction, and then we need to save the hits right there. So after we have input.touchPosition, let's do a comma. And now what we'll do is we have to save all of those hits in that static list. We'll do hits right there. And then a comma, the last piece of information we need is that unityengine.xr.subsystems.trackable type. Any trackable type will be dot plane within polygon. So a trackable type is basically anything that your phone is able to track, like your planes, all that stuff. So now that we're doing that, we need to get the robot in the scene. We need to get the robot in the scene. So we'll say spawn prefab equals instantiate. And instantiate basically just means, um, uh, it basically just means let there be light and there is light. And that's what instantiate is. So what are we instantiating? We are instantiating the robot prefab. And now we have to state where. So where this will be is right where the raycast position hit. So this will be at the hits. There it is. And since this is a list, we have to specify which one. And this will be hits zero. So the very first one, the closest one to you. And then a dot pose dot position. 
it's going to be there. And then we'll just say that it will be at the robot prefab dot transform dot rotation. And there we go. And don't forget to save your script, otherwise we won't see it in Unity. And this is all we need to get the robot in the scene. How does that make sense? Sort of. <laughs> okay, nice Diana. Nice James. So we are detecting a touch on the screen right here. And here we are raycasting to hit a plane the phone has detected. And then here we are creating the robot sphere at the raycast hit point right there. So now that that's done, let's create or let's do the robot touch controller robot touch controller let's double click that and all right here we go so this robot touch controller and the way that we're going to be moving this thing the way that we're going to be uh, moving our object around is we're going to be using a rigid body on the robot. So let's go to the robot sphere. Let's look at assets and look at prefab. And this is the robot sphere. Let's double click on that. So it already has a robot script. Um, and this is just to see the animations and we're not gonna use this. So let's just right click and remove that because that's not the script that we'll be using to control this robot. The script that we'll be using to control this robot is the script that we created, that robot touch controller. So let's drag and drop that right in there. Now the sphere itself, this robot, can anybody tell me how big this robot's gonna be? What's its scale? How big is that thing? Yeah, yeah, James, it is giant. It is so big. 40, 40, 40, exactly. It's huge. And we can take one unity unit to be roughly one meter NIRL in real life. So this sphere is going to be 40 meters. Yeah. And like, will we actually be able to see it on our phone? No, we won't. So let's scale this thing down. Let's go into the scale right there. And let's say the scale is something like 0 0.8 and 0 0.8 and 0 0.8. Now it's teeny weeny. There we go. There we go. Okay. So the robot is appropriately scale scaled at 0 0.8, 0 0.8, and 0 0.8. And then we have the robot touch controller. So let's go over some of the logic for the robot touch controller. Oh, and yes, this robot will also need two other components on this. One will be to detect collisions so it doesn't fall through the plane. So let's add component and add a, oh, let's do a box collider. There we go. And the box collider is very large. It is very large here. So let's look at it from the side. So we can hover over the Z there so you can see those two tiny little arrows over the Z for the size of the uh, box collider. Does everyone see that? Yep, okay, cool. So let's click and drag it to the left. There we go. So it's decreasing in size. That looks about right. And then let's do the Y. Click 
clicking on that and decrease the size there. Yeah. There we go. And then let's look at it from the side. Oh, why is that not? There we go. Let's look at it there. There we go. So now what we need to do is we need to move this box up a little bit. So let's do Y. Let's do bloop. There we go. So we have a box collider. Yes, you see the box. Nice. Okay, so the box collider will register any collisions with another digital game object. If you don't have a collider, things won't collide. But the other thing that we need on this robot is something called a rigid body. So let's add a component and add a rigid body. So a rigid body is the component that allows this game object to feel forces to feel forces. And that's how we'll be moving this robot around. We're gonna add a force, we're gonna add the force in a certain direction and it'll move in that direction. So let's do the robot touch controller right here. So let's describe some of the variables that we'll be that we'll be needing. We'll be needed to dictate how fast this guy is going to be moving. So let's do a public float. Uh, float is just a number that has a couple of decimal points. So let's do a public float and let's call this move speed. And let's set a default uh, value for this and let's say this equals like. 30F and a semicolon. And then we also need a turn speed. So let's do a public, another public float called turn speed. And let's say this equals 5F, 5F. Now the other thing that we need is we need um, some animators on this thing. We need the animator component on this game object in order for us to animate him walking and everything. So we'll have a private animator. Let's call this the robot and then then we'll have a we need that rigid body that's on this game object. So we'll have a private rigid body. Let's call this the robot rigid body. And last but not least, we also need the joystick that's going to be controlling this thing because the joystick has the positioning, the rotation, all that stuff that we need to control this robot. So let's do a private joystick. There it is. Let's just call it joy joystick right there. Uh, the F the F just means that it's a floating point. If I didn't have the F, it's still a default of floating point. However, if it's in a method or something, it would be a type of integer. So we put F in there to signify that this is a floating point decimal uh, numeric value, that sort of thing. That sort of thing. Now, we're gonna change the start. We're gonna change the start to something called an on enable. An on enable fires off. Let's let's hover our cursor over this. This function is called when the object becomes enabled and active. So basically when we create this thing. So what we want to do on enable is we need the animator, we need the rigid body, and we also need the joystick. So the animator and the rigid body, we've done this before. We're just gonna use get component. So we're going to say robot on M equals get component in angle brackets animator. Open closing parentheses and a semicolon. So we're getting that. Now we need the rigid body. So we'll say robot rigid body equals get component in angle brackets rigid body. Like that. Now the joystick going to be a little different because the joystick isn't on this robot sphere. It's not on the robot sphere. It's just in the scene. 
It was just floating around. It's floating around, being at Spang, all alone. And we don't we don't really have any way to find that. But we do because we know that there will be one and only one joystick in the scene at a time. Only one joystick. There can be only one. The one ring to rule them all. So we can use joystick equals find object of type. And what type are we finding? We are finding the joystick. So we'll have the open and closing parentheses and a semicolon. We can only use find object of type if and only if there is one type of this game object, of this thing, in the hierarchy at a time. So that's how we're finding the joystick. Making sense? Nice, Tina. Nice, James. All right, so now we get to the fun part. Now we get to move in the little thing in the first place. So what we need to do is we need to um, move move the, the guy forward a little bit in the forward direction. We need to move this little, little sphere in the forward direction if there's anything on the, uh, any movement on the joystick. So we'll say um, a condition, we'll say if, and we want to detect like, not all because like there's always going to be a like a little bit of movement even if we're not touching it because it's always an approximation so we're going to use something called a dead zone so we're only going to do this thing if the magnitude of this joystick will be a certain certain thing because let's take a look at this let's say this is our joystick right here and then we have another joystick right there. And this is our joystick. So this joystick is measured by two things. We have an X and then we also have a Y. So that should be green. That should be green. There we go. Okay. So we have the X and then we have the Y here. So any movement on this joystick is going to be pointing this way or this way or this way or this way. So here we'll have some values of like maybe this is 0 0.5 in the X and maybe this is 0 0.5 in the Y. So that means this X Y will equal 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. Five. All right. This would be like a negative 0 0.5 in the X and a negative 0 0.5 in the Y. So we can see the magnitude of this joystick and see if and see if the uh, joystick will be above a certain area because if it's just moving like a tiny little bit in here, we don't really just want to ignore that. That's like, mm, doesn't matter. So let's do that in the code. So let's say if joystick dot uh, joystick dot direction dot magnitude is greater than or equal to something like 0 0.2 f then we're going to do the thing then we're going to move forward so we'll say robot rigid body dot add force because the rigid body is the thing that allows it to feel forces and so we have to say what direction this force will be and this is just going to be in the forward direction so we'll say transform dot forward multiplied by the move speed. So how fast it's going. Then what we're going to do is we're going to set the 
walking animation to true. So we're going to walk it. And it'll be true. So we'll say robot anim dot set bool. And what are we doing? Where is this information? What exactly does this mean? So let's go into our Unity project. Right here. So we have an animator. Let's check out this controller. Let's double click on this. And there we go. So we have, this is the animator controller for uh, controlling the animation states of this game object. Let's move this to the side so we can see that here. And then we can also check out this animation tab and check there. Okay, so we have, eh, there it is, walking loop read only. So let's check out what this looks like. So we have, oh, as we move across these frames, we see that the animation, this is the animation that it'll be playing. Right, we have, so we have walking. And so in order for us to walk, this walk and him must be true. Let's check there. So that's what we're gonna do in code. We're gonna check that to true. So we're gonna set that bool and it's called walk underscore nm to true. Just like that. And we'll do an else, we're not moving. So we'll just say, this is going to be set to false. There, to false. So this is handling the forward movement of the robot. So now all we have to do is rotate the robot with the joystick. Now, is that making sense? <laughs> oh, you know, I've been using Unity too long. <laughs> nice. Okay. So it is making sense. So we're moving it forward. So now we got to turn the thing in the first place. So let's do this. We are going to create a vector that this thing is going to be rotating in. So do a vector three, which has an X, Y, and Z, which is the positioning of the uh, coordinates in Unity. And since we're declaring a variable, let's give it a name. Let's say this is the target direction, and this will equal a new vector three. So this target direction will be like a dot and it's going to a certain place and there'll be another dot. And that is how we describe the vector with an X and a Y and a Z. So the X component will be joystick dot direction dot X. We're not, we're not moving in the Y direction. So let's put zero in the Y. And we are moving in the Z direction here. And we're moving in the Z direction based off of the joystick Y direction. So say joystick dot direction dot y. And that's the target direction that the robot will be rotating in. So now what we have to do is we have to rotate another vector to move towards this vector. So to move, we have one vector, we have another vector, we're gonna create another vector to rotate towards that direction. So we'll do a vector three, and this will be called direction. And this will equal a vector three dot rotate towards. So we're rotating direction to the target direction. And we're gonna rotate the transform dot forward vector in the target direction all at a speed of time dot delta time multiplied by the turn speed. This time dot delta time is the time in between frames. We use this to uh, smooth over our motions. 
And then we'll do a 0, 0.0 F for the maximum delta. And that'll just be zero as a standard. Now what we have to do is we have to rotate this game object in that direction. So we'll do transform dot rotation will equal quaternion dot look rotation. And what direction are we looking in? We are looking in direction, like so. So a quaternion has an x, y, and z. Um, a quaternion if, uh, is a better description of rotation that avoids something called gimbal lock uh, when we're just using an x, y, and z for rotations, for vectors. So that's done. Nice. Cool. 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 So now I get to the actual hard part. We get to building it in the first place. So let's go back here. And we see that this navy blue background is the background for the scene. And this means that we're editing the prefab. So to get back to the scene view, I'm going to hover my cursor right in the hierarchy. You see this light arrow right there? Does everyone see that little arrow? Nice. So let's click on that arrow. And then we also need to save the scene. And now we'll get into the build settings. So your phone is in developer mode. Let's plug it in by USB. Plug it in by USB. Save the scene. And now that we have this, let's unlock it and all that stuff. Device is ready, ready to go. All right, so let's go into edit and project settings. So in the project settings, we have the XR plugin management right here. We're initializing XR on startup. AR core is installed, that's good. All right, cool. Now what we have to do is we have to change our build settings. Let's go to file and build settings because right now I'm on PC, Mac and Linux standalone, but I'm not building for that. I'm building for an Android. So let's click on Android and click on switch platform. If you're building on iOS, you're gonna to switch to iOS. And then we switch it. Let me switch it up. This might take a little bit. Now I'm a big fan of learning new skills one of the things that I wanted to learn was actually juggling, but I didn't learn it because I didn't really have the balls. <laughs> okay, so we have switched to Android. Now we have to we have to um, make sure that our player settings, are all set up and ready to go. So let's check out the player settings, clicking on that. Okay, cool. So first things first, this Vulkan graphics API in the player settings, we have to get rid of that. So let's click on that, highlight it, click on the minus icon. Clicking on the minus icon. And you would think that I would know how to juggle because of the circus and everything, but no, I do not. Okay, cool. So Vulcan is, Vulcan is removed. So let's scroll down a little bit now. And so Uh, Vulkan is a graphics API that it does not run on the Android graphics card here. So the graphics card on your Android phone runs on OpenGL E uh, S3, which is the updated version of that. So let's look at the minimum API level. I'm going to click on this and the minimum API level for... AR core is API level 24, nugget. 
So let's click on that there. Now, this is a very important step. Instead of the scripting backend mono, we're going to change this and go to IL2CPP. IL2CPP. And then we're going to uncheck the architecture ARM version 7 and check ARM64. That is the architecture of the chip of an Android phone. So now that we have all of that, all of that is there, let's go into the XR plugin management. Now, in order for us to use AR core, check AR core. If you don't have this checked, you might see a black screen right there. No problem. Thanks for tuning in. We're just going to build this and then we're going to see if it works on the phone. Let's close this and let's look at the build settings once again. And we see, oh shoot, oh snap, no scenes in build. We have to have a scene in here in order for us to build it. So let's click on add open scene and there's my sample scene. So now, <gasps> moment of truth, the moment of truth, we build it onto the phone. All right, so we are going to click on build and run. Clicking on build and run. Now, best practices here is we'll have a new folder called builds and then double click and build and this is where we're gonna build it. So we have to have a file name and let's say this is the AR robot assistant. Assistant, assistant, there we go. So. And then we click on <gasps> save. Make sure. Oh, come on. Settings. Uh, let me toggle my developer options. Sometimes this happens. Um, and USB debugging. Okay, let's toggle. Toggle. Okay. Always allow on this computer, allow. Okay, now click on retry. There we go. Building, building. <gasps> I'm holding my breath. I'm holding my breath. This is almost as stressful as that one time I threw a boomerang, but it didn't come back, so now I live in constant fear. <laughs> Building native library, IL2CPP. Okay. Okay. This is a good, good sign. This is a real good sign. Real good sign. So how about those gas prices, huh? Dang. Thanks, Russia. Although, <laughs> though, I, I farted on my wallet and now I have gas money. <laughs> uh <laughs> <laughs> but it, <laughs> the recording will be sent to you by uh by email and you'll also have the github repository to this project Have I ever had a demo like this where the build and run did not work? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's very tense. It is very tense. Usually I can solve it within the hour though. And it is building. Oh, there we go. I'm 64. This is a good sign. <gasps> building Gradle. <gasps> We just might make it. Hmm. 
<laughs> not the cradle. Not the cradle. <laughs> oh, coffee and APK to the vice. Oh. Oh, there we go. Using Unity. Okay. Why are you using app? Yes. There we go. <gasps> and we have. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Let me connect my device. Ah, install, reconnect. So a power mirror is what I use to mirror what's on my phone. Always allow uh, to my to my computer. Building, building, building. A power mirror. Okay, yes. There we go. Start now while using. Okay, there it is. Oh, and we see we have plain detection. Let me, oh, hold on. Oh, there we go. Okay, so you see my little rubber ducky. Uh, so this is the plane. Let's tap. Tap. Oh, shoot. Why is this? Come on. Do the thing. Ugh. Do the thing. Let's see. Let's close this. Whoops. Oh, I probably forgot to do something. What did I forget to do? Assessment origin. Oh, snap. That's right. We don't have a robot prefab to instantiate. Oh, snap. Prefab right there. Boom. Okay. Save. Now we have to build and run again. But that is the last step. You'll see it on there and it'll move around. And we, this might take a while. What application am I using to mirror my phone? I am using something called A Power Mirror. A Power Mirror. I know, but it's all right. It's all right. Um, there is... I'll have a little demo on my phone. It's basically the same thing. And there it is, AR robots. So let's look at A Power Mirror again. A Power Mirror, continue trial here. There we go. I would be a sorceress. <laughs> there we go. Start now. All right. So this is the fully fledged um, expansion of the AR robots that's demoed in the AR uh, XR dev course. Oh, nerds. Come on. Oh. All right. Well, <laughs> refresh. Come on. Oh, shoot. Come on. Okay, there we go, start now. All right, there we go. So we have plane, we have plane detection, tap to place, there he is. And let's move around and there we go, there he goes. Boop. Woo. And this is the fully fledged game that you've learned to create some expansion off of this workshop to, whoopsies. <laughs> to um, this fully fleshed game in the XR Dev course. And there we go. So this guy who's moving around in the joystick package is the same code, the same stuff, same packages, and it's just expanding on it. And boop, 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 boop. 
right there. Okay. And that is it for today's workshop. That is it for today's workshop. Ba -ba -da -ba. Clap, 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 clap. Yes, yes. And since that is the end of this workshop, I will be pushing all of these things to GitHub repository. So you'll have a chance to pull that and then build it onto your phone if you have that. Um, if you want to create an environment around the robot, does it have to be prefab as well? Like you put that scene and stuff. Mm. You see, this is where this is where placement gets a little tricky because um, when you're placing digital objects in the environment, your digital objects have to be contextually aware of the environment. So that is either using uh, AR anchors or plane detection, um, or on the HoloLens, it's like scene uh, recognition, that sort of things. Is AR Foundation compatible to be deployed on the HoloLens? Yes, you can use AR Foundation on HoloLens. However, it is severely limited. If you made it a prefab, would it not follow the robot as well? It depends if the thing that you're creating is a child of the robot or not. So if the environment is a child of the robot, the environment will follow the robot around. So since this is the end of the technical portion of this workshop, I'm gonna stop sharing and I will invite, invite the man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> all right thank you very much nikisa I, I have to say i always enjoy i always enjoy hosting these workshops with you the the jokes kill me i have to I have to leave a notepad so i can take notes they're awesome. <laughs> nice. I love these ones. I'll awesome. leave it to you. All right. Thanks a lot again. It was a it was an awesome presentation. I'm sure everyone learned uh, everyone learned a lot today. Um, just you know, I'm gonna take a few minutes here uh, before we reinvite Nikisa back on stage to uh, answer some questions, some more questions. So if you guys do have any questions, please feel free to. Uh, post some of the questions tab, and again, at the end of the uh, this short presentation, I will we'll have some time to answer them live. And uh, just a reminder again to everyone, I saw this a couple of times in the chat as the workshop was going. Um, this workshop is recorded. You will get the recordings as well as any of the resources that Nikisa used in the workshop sent to you via email after the workshop. Anyone who registered for the workshop will, will receive the recording and the resources. So no worries there. And also, if the video was a little bit uh, flaky when when the workshop was going on, don't worry. In the recording, it will be fixed. Uh, it's just that when we're live streaming this, sometimes uh, because of bandwidth, you know, the, the quality is not there a uh, hundred percent. But that's no issues. Um, also, I just wanted to run uh, through a bit of our course options and uh, and information here. Uh, if you enjoyed today's workshop, we'd love to have you continue your learning journey with us at CircuitStream. You know, my favorite part of hosting these workshops is uh, is you know apart from having Nikisa and Nikisa's jokes and uh, you know just a great presentation and what we can achieve with the with the workshop is to show off some of the amazing work that our students have created over the years. You know, whether it's uh, creating a unique uh, Unity scene or building interactive AR experiences with Euphoria or uh, scripting mind blowing experiences using uh, C Sharp. You know, ultimately, we love to help our students along their learning path and help them to achieve amazing things. And on screen, you'll see just a few examples of uh, Circuit Stream students who have gone out to carve out a, a career in XR after learning with us. You know, I would like to 
introduce you to our uh, fairly new self-paced course for app development. This one is a six hour video course that allows you to move at your own pace and it will provide an in-depth uh, guide on how to build your first app for your portfolio. And uh, as Nikisa mentioned, we also have our C-sharp scripting fundamentals course which is a four-week program focusing only on C-sharp coding for those folks interested in diving a little uh, deeper into the language. And uh, next up, we also have our uh, XR Development with Unity program. You know, this is a completely beginner-friendly 10-week project-based program that is also live online and instructor-led. Uh, Nakisa is uh, one of the instructors instructors as well and in this program you will focus on making AR and VR applications in Unity with uh, three hours of instruction per week, lifetime access to both the class recordings as well as the five office hours per week and uh, with the plus package of this program you will also have 10 hours of one-on-one -on -one time with our experts which can be used for both personal projects or uh, you know course material or any questions in general related to XR development development. Um, this course is available through us directly. Uh, we actually have a cohort coming up on May 17th and it's also available through any of our local university partners. For example, the University of British Columbia, uh, they have a cohort coming up on May 17th, as well as University of Toronto with the same cohort start date, as well as University of San Diego and uh, University of California, Riverside. Um, Next, we have our XR design, which we call it interaction design and prototyping for XR program. Uh, this is also a beginner friendly 10 week instructor led program with the main focus of this uh, 10 week program being on designing experiences for AR and VR versus uh, web and mobile applications. You know. So much like the XR development program, you'll have three hours of instruction per week, lifetime access to both the class recordings and the five office hours per week, and with the option of the 10 hours of one-on-one -on -one time with our experts uh, if you choose to go with the PLUS package. Uh, this uh, course is also available through us directly, as well as any of our university partners. Uh, you know, our, our cohort starts on April 20th, uh, similarly, University of British Columbia's uh, cohort is also on April 20th. Uh, University of Toronto uh, has a cohort coming up on April 11th. And uh, University of San Diego uh, has a cohort coming up on April 20th. And UC Riverside's cohort is also on April 20th as well. Uh, lastly, we have our amazing Unity Developer Bootcamp, which will prepare you for a 3D development career. You know, it helps you build a portfolio of 10 plus projects and our one on one career services helps ensure you make the right connections in the XR industry and uh, helps you make the best first impression on potential employers. Uh, one thing to mention is that the bootcamp is only available through CircuitStream uh, directly. So just keep that in mind. And uh, beyond the lessons themselves, we've, all, we've also created a robust community of XR learners. You know, all of our students and alumni get lifetime access to all of the materials and the recordings from uh, from class, in addition to lifetime access to all of the perks associated with our community. Uh, you know, our students, ex our student experience coordinator, Arki, runs all kinds of awesome uh, programs and events and is really dedicated to supporting our students and alumni. She facilitates extra office hours, support groups and uh, demo days and so much more. And uh, when it comes to our 10 week programs, uh, there is no experience required. Again, it is beginner friendly, so beginners have no fear. And in terms of, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, the programs. I gave you the details of what they entail. Now, I'm sure many of you were wondering about tuition prices for our uh, courses. So I'm going to take a minute to discuss the finances involved with you. Uh, we offer two different packages for both our XR development and our XR design program, and as well as our new self-paced course that is sold individually. But for the two 10-week programs, the starter package includes the course of your choice, 
uh, while the plus package includes the addition of a four week scripting, C sharp scripting fundamentals short course and the 10 hours of one on one time with our experts that I had mentioned. Um, the prices that you see on screen are in USD and they represent our regular tuition prices. And a quick word on the university tuition. Uh, the starter pack and the plus pack are sold for the same prices as what you see on screen now. Uh, the only difference is that our Canadian university partners process their tuitions in Canadian dollars, but in order to access that pricing, you must live in the province where the partner is located. And uh, lastly, our boot camp has a tuition of $14,995 uh, USD. Uh, however, we are currently offering a launch scholarship of $7,000 to individuals who qualify. But, uh, you know, this is a limited time offer and we only have a few of these left. So if you are interested, I would highly recommend that uh, you act as quickly as possible to ensure that we can uh, we have one of those scholarships left for you. And on the topic of finances, um, we do offer payment plans for our boot camp as well as our 10-week courses starter or plus pack so if you would prefer not to pay in full all at once uh, you're more than welcome to take advantages uh, to advantage of any of these plans um, for our international students uh, we have a three six or 12 month payment plan available and for our american students uh, who are u.s citizens uh, we do up to five years uh, through our external financing partner climb uh, there is an application process involved with that um, which one of uh, the members of the enrollment team can definitely assist with you if you have any questions on that and uh, on screen you'll see uh, our admissions team so please uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, through our website or through a call or email if you've already connected with one of us uh, you know I, I do want to mention that uh, we're a little bit different uh, in, in the way that uh, we do things when it comes to the admission team. We're, we're involved in the before, during, and after part of your registration process. You know, we're here to help answer any questions you might have about our financials, your learning or career goals, anything about Unity or, you know, VR and AR devices and so on. Uh, feel free to head over to the learning page on our website or any of our affiliated partner websites to learn more about each of the courses, to download a syllabus, or to submit an application to enroll so that a member of our admissions team knows to reach out. And uh, this will wrap up the, my, the last portion of the presentation for today. At this point, I'd like to invite Nikisa back on the stage so we can get started on uh, any of your questions. Uh, Nikisa, are you still with us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so I do see here that we have a couple of questions. Let's see here. Um, all right, so as a follow up on my question during the session, can I put game objects as children of the session origin to put them in the AR world? They would be, uh, I'm guessing that's reactive to the phone then. Is that correct? Uh, for example, a sphere at 50 centimeters in front of the phone. Um, oh, I see. Um, you, you can, you can put game objects as a child of the AR session origin and have them be 50 centimeters in front of the phone. Um, when your game object is a child of your AR session origin, it'll follow the phone and just remain where it is all the time, um, every time. So if that is the goal that you are um, wanting to achieve, that's that's how you do it, yeah. Perfect. And then uh, the last question that's on the list. I have very limited dev scripting experience and want to learn how to do this type of thing, Unity and such in the AR world. What would be the best starting point for education? Circus stream. <laughs> <laughs> I like that answer. <laughs> yeah, we we got everything. Um, if you're looking for for like just regular tutorials uh, on the Unity website, there is a Unity Learn. 
unitylearn.com. And this has like intro to scripting. It has some tutorials that you can follow along if you want to get started there. Um, so yeah, there's, there's unitylearn.com. And if you want a little bit deeper, a little bit more understanding, there is circuit stream. Absolutely. As we mentioned, you know, there are 10 week programs that are completely beginner friendly. So we'll start mm -hmm. from the basics and we'll move up from there. Perfect. So that was the last of the questions that we had in the questions tab. So um, what we're going to do, unless there's any other questions, I feel, oh, let's see. One more question that came up. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's another one. Let's see. What kind of eligibility is required to meet for having the scholarship of the course you mentioned before where six seats available? Um, so in terms of, I can take that one. Uh, in terms of eligibility, um, you do have to connect with a member of the uh, enrollment team, such as myself. Um, there are a few questions. We just want to get a better understanding of what your educational goals are and what you're hoping to get out of the boot camp. And uh, there is also uh, an aptitude test that uh, you need to complete. Um, there is a certain level of experience required for the boot camp. Um, and after that, so the third stage would be an interview with the education team. Uh, and after that, you know, it would be determined whether you qualify for the uh, scholarship or not. You know, these are fairly simple. I mean, I've had uh, individuals who have done it in, in a day. So um, it's not a big process at all. But that's kind of the steps that you have to take in order to uh, qualify for one of the scholarships. And uh, in terms of six seats available, um, before this uh, workshop started, yes, uh, we were at six seats available uh, with the scholarship, so that, that might change. They are on a first come, first serve basis. So just to give you an idea, you know, out of the pool of people who qualify, you know, obviously the next step would be uh, the finances and the financial side of things. So it is on a first come, first serve basis, essentially. I hope that answers the question there. And um, let's say, are, and then, then the next one is, are there any cohorts after April? Uh, absolutely, um, there are. We do run cohorts uh, every, so the, the programs, for example, for the 10 week programs, after the 10 weeks is, are done, uh, we take one week and then we start another cohort. So we offer multiple cohorts throughout the year. Um, depending on which program you're interested in, there are multiple cohorts throughout the year. Perfect. All right, I think that was the last of the questions. Um, I wanna take the time to thank Nakisa again for the awesome presentation. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Again, the recording of this workshop will be sent to all of you via email. It was great having you guys. And if you do have any questions, again, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're always more than happy to help out. Uh, hope to be able to support you guys in, in your education and hope to see you guys soon in future, uh, in future events. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.